So welcome everybody and thank you for joining us on One Health Day. We are so happy to celebrate One Health Day together um, this year with Actasia. And our webinar today is a celebration of One Health Collaborative Cultures. My name is Dawn Peacock and I'm the um, Director of Programmes for Actasia. And today we have worked collaboratively to get that in there to start with, with our um, board of uh, chairman of the board, Helen Winter, who is dual in dual roles here today, also a medical oncologist. Hi there, Dawn. I think I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes for people to join <laughs> us, if that's okay. Fantastic. Um, because um, you know it'd be great for everyone to hear what Laura's got to say. So I'm just going to leave it a couple more minutes. Great to see so many joining. Great to see Arbiter. Arbiter, I'm remembering our conversation in Oxford last year. And um, it's just fantastic that you're uh, joining us today. So um, thanks again for all your input into um, really opening my eyes to, to um, One Health. Uh, Peifen, I don't know if you want to introduce some of our colleagues from Asia. Uh, I think we if are you slowly attend, just um, slowly come in. We have... Um, our China Caring for Life Education Manager, Isabel Zhang from uh, Shenzhen. Hey, um, yes. Uh, yes. And um, we have um, several um, Chinese um, audience from Shanghai, I believe, and Guangzhou already in, is joining us. And actually, we should encourage everyone to introduce themselves here as well. They can send you a chat message. 大家如果參與的話,我們可以把自己的姓名跟你的這個單位呢寫出來, uh, invite them they can talk in the chat to say who they are, so we know where they base as well. Super. Wonderful. So we've got a few more people now. So I think in the interest of time, we, we will get started, Dawn. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm very excited about this program. Um, it really is truly cross, cross, cross disciplinary, not only from veterinary and clinician um, colleagues, but also um, Adam Hart, who's going to be sharing his insights into citizen science, which is certainly something new that I've been learning about this year and hopefully something very uh, that could become very relevant to, to many of us um, wanting to establish new collaborations. Um, so we're going to start off with Laura Khan, followed by that we're going to have Terence Ryans from the University of Oxford who was there at that, at that first meeting this time last year. Um, and then Adam Hart, he's recorded his um, uh, presentation today but he will be more than happy to be contacted about his science communication and citizen science work. Um, and then it's back to Bristol for the final three speakers, Christian Raya, Sarah Gould, who's a veterinary oncologist, and then myself just talking about one of the collaborative projects that we've been establishing. So um, welcome everyone. I hope you really um, enjoy the program that we've put up um, for you today. And uh, over to you, Dawn. Thank you. I'll just do a short introduction um, about how this started and, and where this this webinar came from and it actually started last year in September 2019 at the William Osler Centre at the Oxford University with Professor Ryan so we're delighted that he's here today to share a, a presentation with us. Our meeting was called Health and Wellbeing, Science and Humanity are One and the idea to use the One Health framework was firmly planted for us and Actasia has been using the One Health um, framework within our projects. The use the use of One Health previously had sort of been thought of more as a, maybe just a medical uh, um, framework to use and vets and environmental professionals had not really been um, embraced it just yet. But what we've seen moving on for you know, a year ahead is that vets and environmentalists are leading on One Health and indeed collaboration is happening across all of the disciplines. COVID-19 has been a devastating pandemic, but we do hope to take the opportunities where we can stretch our boundaries, we can learn more, and we can seek to solve complex problems for all species together. Actasia have continued to try and role model and stretch our boundaries, and we've joined an alliance called End Pandemics, and we'll pop the um, website just in the chat box for anyone to have a look at. And this alliance has one goal, ending pandemics, looking at reducing demand, stopping wildlife trafficking, 
and uh, reforming agriculture, as well as protecting nature. And Act Asia's um, projects link really well to the work that <laughs> they're doing. So we hope to do more things like this. Usually with NGOs, we're quite comfortable working with other NGOs, but End Pandemics is a bit different because we also include governments and businesses. So we're stretching those boundaries bit by bit. So we hope that you'll enjoy today. We know that you will have questions for the speakers and I will do a short introduction of the speakers at the beginning of each presentation and then at the end we will have a little bit of time for Q&A. So please use the Q&A box and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. So I can see that Professor Ryan has joined us. Hi Professor Ryan. If, for now, if you're happy, you can close your video and mute, and I will just welcome Laura Khan and share the next little presentation. Give me one second to swap over. And Laura, if you want to open your video, and I will share one second. I've got to check I've got the right one. There we go. Is that correct? It is. Yeah, Helen, can you see? Just check in. I think that, can everyone just see the one slide? Well, do you want to put it into uh, presentation mode or you want to leave it in that mode? Um, it's oh, there you go. Is that better? Yes, yeah. that's better. Perfect. Okay. I'm right here. Just let me know when you want me to move on. Oh, okay. And, yeah. and you've got about 10 minutes, Laura. Okay, will do. Okay, well, uh, thank you, everyone. I'm delighted to be a part of your One Health Day. Many thanks to Act Asia for supporting this and for uh, uh, Hey Sue and Dr. Helen Winter for uh, inviting me. I'm going to give you a One Health approach to biomedical translational research and microbial ecology. Next slide, please. Next slide. So One Health, very simply the concept that human, animal, and environmental and ecosystem health is linked. This is an ancient concept really understood by intuitive, uh, intuitively by indigenous peoples, uh, but it's a relatively new term. Um, and it serves as a very useful framework for examining and addressing complex health issues, including cancer and other chronic diseases, emerging zoonotic diseases like SARS and SARS-CoV-2, antimicrobial resistance, other challenges are multifactorial and require an interdisciplinary approach. And our One Health Initiative website is on this slide. It's a labor of love for us. Uh, since 2008, it's been serving as a global repository for all news and information pertaining to One Health. Next slide, please. Now, I usually come to this from the emerging diseases perspective, but I thought for this audience, it would be of most interest to talk about translational biomedical research and microbial ecology. And I'll show you how One Health is so important uh, in applying to these, uh, to these realms. Next slide, please. So let's first talk about translational research. Cancer and other chronic diseases have many causes, genetic, environmental, lifestyle, but people live for about 80 years or more, so lifetime studies are difficult and expensive. They, they do exist. For example, the Framingham Heart Study begun uh, in 1950 in Framingham, Massachusetts. But uh, I think it's important to recognize that not only do people get cancer, but dogs get cancer too. And in fact, it's the leading cause of death, disease associated death in dogs. But in contrast to humans, dogs live at most 20 years, uh, sadly for those of us who live and love our dogs. Uh, but they do share their, uh, ho the home environment with, with their owners. 
And um, it's important to recognize that different breeds have unique genetic susceptibilities to different cancers. Next slide, please. This is a very important paper published in the New England Journal by Ostrander in uh, 2012, uh, looking at the canine genome of the domestic dog, which was domesticated about 30,000 years ago, and has been living with humans, sharing our home environments for at least 15,000 years. Well, they're saying 30,000. Genetic evidence is suggesting perhaps 15,000. But the breeds today have descended from a few founders in Victorian times, relatively short from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, and these genetic traits of the founders are often overrepresented in purebred dogs. Uh, and so you see a number of recessive traits. And you can think of purebred dogs as kind of inbred, uh, analogous to um, inbred human populations. Next slide, please. So uh, the American Kennel Club recognizes about 173 dog breeds, but the European clubs up to around 400 dog breeds. And you can see um, just how vast the different dog breeds there, there are. Next slide, please. So there are faulty canine genes that have human counterparts. Nova Scotia duck trolling retrievers uh, get autoimmune diseases such as lupus. Uh, Bedlington terriers can develop a metabolic disorder, copper toxicosis. There's uh, epilepsy in a number of dog breeds. Uh, Norfolk terriers are susceptible to ichthyosis, which is a skin disorder and Doberman pinchers are susceptible to narcolepsy. Next slide, please. So uh, as, again, as I, as I mentioned, a number of different dog breeds are susceptible to a variety of different uh, illnesses and cancers. Next slide, please. So this is um, the Morris Animal Golden Retriever Study, which I'm uh, very, happy to be to have enrolled my golden retriever and he's now seven years old and has already had one cancer. This is a prospective longitudinal study. It's the canine version of the Framingham Heart Study that was done on humans. They have enrolled about 3,000 purebred golden retrievers across the United States. Uh, since puppyhood they get annual exams, very detailed owner questionnaires, and submission of clinical samples over their lifetime. And the aim is to identify environmental genetic and dietary risk factors for a variety of diseases such as cancer. Uh, and if you're interested, there are websites at the bottom of the page. Next slide, please. So it's important to recognize then that humans and animals get many of the same diseases. Cats get asthma, dogs get cancer, uh, dogs get obesity, and there's actually a correlation between obesity in humans and their dogs. Uh, similar lifestyles, I suppose. But uh, we can take advantage of this. And, and one of the other important things about doing a One Health approach to cancer research is that um, while uh, genetically modified uh, mice have been important in providing certain uh, my, uh, genetic or detailed information about cancers. Their cancers are not spontaneous. Their cancers are not similar to humans. I mean, we don't live in a laboratory generally. We live in our homes and our pets share our homes with us. And so rather than uh, what some might call the, uh, the abuse or the, uh, um, you know, taking advantage of susceptible animals. These animals, like dogs and cats, are beloved members of the family. Uh, we want to do what's best for them, and if they develop a cancer, we will do anything uh, that we can to try to save their lives. So the whole opposition by animal rights um, activists is rendered mute, moot when you're trying to help a dog uh, overcome its cancer. Next slide, please. So this was also an interesting book. Uh, Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz, pictured on your left, is a cardiologist and psychiatrist, and she was doing studies on tamarind monkeys at the Los Angeles Zoo. 
uh, and discovered to her surprise that um, monkeys can develop tach uh, what's called capture cardiomyopathy that has been known by the veterinary medical community for over 30 years. Uh, and she had this uh, light bulb moment where she realized that it's the same entity as Takasobu's cardiomyopathy, recognized by Japanese cardiologists in, uh, 2000, in 2000, about 30 years after the veterinarians recognized it. Anyway, she uh, wrote this book, Ubiquity, with her co-author, uh, Ms. Barbara Bowers, pictured on the right, looking at a number of different uh, disease processes analogous between animals and uh, people, focusing on the psychiatric and cardiac uh, behavioral dis uh, dis disorders. Next slide, please. Now, uh, it's also important to recognize that veterinary medicine has been using fecal transplants for over 100 years. If the, they had a horse with diarrhea, they would stick a tube in the rectum of one horse, a healthy horse, and stick the other end of the tube into the rectum of a sick horse. Uh, with the flow of uh, fecal matter from healthy to sick, they were able to cure the diarrhea in the horse. Well, uh, it wasn't a popular idea in human medicine uh, until the advent of the increase in antimicrobial resistance, rendering many of the antibiotics uh, you know, no longer effective. So, so now fecal transplantation is becoming increasingly uh, embraced by medical practitioners to try to treat certain diseases such as um, antibiotic-induced uh, colitis or C. difficile colitis. Next slide, please. So that brings me to the second part of my talk, the fact that we live in a microbial world and we need to learn to live in it better. Now, of course, pandemics are one way to look at it, but uh, we also have to recognize that our bodies are covered with microbes and we have uh, microbes in them as well. Next slide, please. So we are adversely impacting the global biome, the microbiome of our planet. And how are we doing that? Through poor sanitation, indiscriminate antibiotic use by both humans and animals, untreated human and animal waste being spread on agricultural fields, altering, uh, interacting with the microbes in the soils. That's land and water contamination that can lead to food and waterborne illnesses. And many micro, uh, wildlife pick up these resistant microbes and resistant genes and spread them far and wide. Next slide, please. Humans and their domesticated animals now make up about 96 to 98% of the global terrestrial mammalian biomass on the planet. There's just not that many mammalian wildlife left. Uh, and uh, our, you know, we have a huge impact on the planet because of that. We need to eat and our uh, fecal uh, wastes uh, are contaminating, as I said, contaminating uh, the environment. Next slide, please. This is an important study uh, done by Berendis and colleagues published in Nature Sustainability in 2018 they estimated that uh, the global population of humans, over 7 billion, and their domesticated livestock, about 30 billion, produce about 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter each year, 80% of which is made up is from animals. And yet our sanitation systems only address human fecal matter. The largest producers of the fecal matter from the animal side are cattle, sheep, and chickens. Um, next slide, please. And let's not forget that, according to UNICEF, about 1 billion people openly if, uh, defecate. About 60% of them are in India. And it should come as no surprise that India has some of the most resistant bacteria in the world, uh, resistant to antibiotics. Next slide, please. So I did a back of the envelope calculation and estimated that uh, the total fecal matter produced by humans and their animals uh, would fill about 1.6 Olympic-sized swimming pools each year. Uh, and by 2030, it can go up to 1.8 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. So where does all this fecal matter go? Well, it goes into our environment, uh, which affects us. Next slide, please. Affects our health. This uh, paper, again, by Berendis and Nature Sustainability, 
looked at country level estimates of fecal matter in 2014. And you can see China, India have very high levels of estimates. They've got large numbers of people, over a billion people, and they've got huge numbers of uh, domesticated animals as well. Next slide, please. But when they looked at the country levels with the highest animal to human fecal ratio, something interesting came out. And it looked like Australia and New Zealand, because they have more animals, a lot more animals, sheep uh, than people, they actually have the highest animal to human fecal ratio. Next slide, please. Now, why is that important? Well, if you look at antibiotic consumption per person, um, Australia and New Zealand are way up at the top. Uh, which was very surprising because why, why would they uh, have the highest antibiotic consumption per person? Well, uh, the question we must ask is, is there a relationship between environmental fecal contamination and antibiotic consumption? Is all this fecal matter in the environment making people sick uh, and then leading to their increased use of antibiotics? I haven't seen a study looking at that, but I think it's a very important question that we must ask because we generally don't think about you know, how we get sick or the microbial ecology of the world in which we live and how it influences our health and uh, our acquisition of disease. Next slide, please. So again, the Human Microbiome Project uh, is leading to all sorts of new discoveries and making us rethink about how we approach health and disease. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, more microbes in us and on us than uh, human cells. Uh, and animals and plants have their microbiomes too. And the thing we have to recognize is that antibiotics um, are indiscriminate in their uh, action. And they're going to kill off both the good and the bad bacteria when we use them. And there's some evidence that antibiotics are fueling the rise of chronic diseases, including autoimmune diseases and some cancers. And I wanna point you to this book, The Missing Microbes by Martin Blazer, uh, an infectious disease physician who has done some very interesting studies uh, with strong evidence that, uh, that indeed our obesity epidemic, the rise of foodborne, uh, uh, foodborne um, uh, food allergies uh, could be uh, attributed to the increasing use of antibiotics since the uh, advent of the antibiotic era. Next slide, please. So the question then is, well, if antibiotics and the rise of antimicrobial resistance is making the use of antibiotics increasingly difficult, um, but we could argue that antibiotics in a way is working against nature. It's kind of like the uh, greenhouse gases, if you will, analogous to climate change, antimicrobial resistance is an analogous problem. We are working against nature rather than with it. So what are the natural foes of bacteria? Well, bacteriophages are. They are very specific. They're less of a problem with antimicrobial resistance. This is a great um, story with Dr. Stephanie Stratti, who saved her husband's life with bacteriophages, which is a real game changer uh, in, for the medical community, increasing interest in bacteriophage therapy. There's still a long way to go, but um, that might be an important answer to uh, the issue of antimicrobial resistance. Next slide, please. I'm almost done. Almost done. Oh. I'm almost done. <laughs> Thanks. So, so we must work with nature, not against it. Uh, you know, we don't want to uh, kill off our good bacteria with the bad, uh, but uh, there's still a lot of work to go. Uh, with making bacteriophage therapy a true uh, clinical, uh, of clinical use. Next slide, please. So in conclusion then, translational comparative medicine is the study of disease processes across species. We must recognize that many, uh, the same diseases that we get, animals get too. Uh, purebred dogs provide a unique window into the genetics of disease etiology that we should utilize. They share our homes. They're beloved members of our families, and when they get sick, we want to treat them. So the whole issue of animal rights is out the window. Uh, plus, it's an effective uh, way to study cancers. We must investigate our planet's biome and our microbiomes to understand their role in health and disease. Uh, and the One Health Framework then provides an important strategic 
uh, strat an important strategy for examining and addressing chronic diseases, emerging diseases, <clears throat> antimicrobial resistance, microbial ecologies across humans, animals, environments, and ecosystems. Next slide, please. Uh, and so this is my team, the One Health Initiative team, uh, and uh, I just wanted to acknowledge them and please visit our website. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Sorry to hassle you on the time. We want, no to, listen. We want to listen to it all and we look forward to the, the Q&A sure. section um, where I'm sure there'll be lots of questions being asked in there. So it is time for me now to welcome Professor Ryan. If you'd like to um, share your video and unmute. Let's see if we can make this work. Let me stop sharing. I'm, I'm not sharing anymore, am I? Professor Ryan, are you okay? Are you ready yes, to yes, share? Yes, no, no. How do I come on here? Um, so you, on the bottom left, you should have a, um, a start video or show video. Yes. Button. Let's have a look. You've stopped it, it says. Oh, there we go. Does it, is that better? You cannot start your video because... There I... you are. You're on. On? We've got you back. We can see okay, you. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now I've got to find my... You fi I'll introduce you while you find your, your talk and then I'll, I'll be there to help share it. One second. So for people that are with us today that don't know Professor Ryan, he's a huge supporter of Actasia and we're delighted that he's given his time to be with us today. Um, Professor Terence Ryan is Emeritus Fellow of Green Templeton College and Emeritus Professor of Dermatology at the University of Oxford. He's a renowned dermatologist um, and when he's not traveling due to his advisory roles, He's an archivist for the history of medicine at the home of Sir William Osler. And I'm sure um, Professor Ryan will talk a little bit about um, Sir William Osler and his background in his talk today, which is the importance of kindness and friendliness with collaborative and interdisciplinary approaches. No, Lovely. <clears throat> That's fine. So if we minimize this screen that you've got for Zoom, it, yeah, just the, if you go to the top bar and on the right hand side, there's um, an X, a square and a little line. If you press the little line on the right hand side, there we go, that just minimize it. Yep. And then minimize again. Lovely. Oh, I and then find your yes. celebration. I can see it. <laughs> Great. Right. Lovely. And then at the bottom, on the right hand side, just before you can see 70%, there's a um, just a little bit to the right, other, other right, uh, the other way. There we go. Perfect. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. With you. As you say, I'm talking about friendship. Friendship is a theme associated with the father of modern medicine, Sir William Osler, whose death in 13 Narn Gardens, Oxford, on the 31st of December, was remembered in the autumn 2020 by centenary events that included the launch of Eye Care by Actasia. Science and humanity are one, so said the Greeks, Hippocrates, etc. Care technology, which is science, must be applied with care attitude, which is humanity. Care attitude includes sympathy, empathy, compassion, awareness of dignity, bringing sheer joy and friendship. Each of these emotions may differ in how they are received and transmitted by the brain. 
in October 2020, the Royal College of Physicians wrote, medical competency should not be reduced to technical expertise. Also, the right balance adds compassion and a human touch. So friendship, Osla spoke about, he showed it to thousands of people in his home at 39 Gardens, now known as the Open Arms. The Minister of Health in 1919 wrote that Osler's greatest power was friendship. Osler quoted an early writing, Anatomy of Melancholy, 1661, find a friend who makes you laugh. Contemporary Oxford University has made studies of the brain and the brain registers the smiles and laughter of friendship in the evolutionarily new cerebral cortex, which transmits them to the emotional center deep in the oldest part of the brain. It results in the release of anxiety and pain suppressors, suppressing chemicals and creates a balanced response from the autonomic nervous system activated by fright and flight. Friendship is the single most important influence factor influencing our health, well-being and happiness. So said Professor Dunbar of the Oxford Department of Psychology in the year 2018. I repeat, it's an amazing statement. Friendship is the single most important factor influencing our health, well-being and happiness. <clears throat> My experience of the brain's control of the inflammatory reaction has been in Africa and Asia. For instance, I remember the death from a non-venomous snake bite due to fear. The traditional healer exorcising <coughs> evil spirits is believed to have, which have believed, been believed to have determined the bite, has shown that it can be life-saving. It is a skill I do not have. There are two interventions acting on the brain as anti-inflammatory, which I mentor at the Institute of Applied Dermatology in Kerala in India. They are one, <clears throat> the power of friendly counseling and yoga. Each of these have been recognized as therapeutic in themselves. And I'm now working with Bill and Melinda Gates to spread their influence around India in the morbidity control therapy. Their effect on endorphin release and vagal nerve enhancement is proven. <coughs> I believe that the brain is able to cause and suppress inflammation and my studies go back some 40 years. Meditating on the crucifixion can induce painful and bleeding wounds. This happened to St. Francis of Assisi. It happened also some 40 years ago to a Portuguese peasant woman who caused great anxiety to the Archbishop of, of uh, Lisbon because every Friday she was able to produce a swelling and bleeding bleeding in the shape of a crucifixion on her forehead. He wanted to know the mechanisms. And at that time, we didn't realize how emotion through the brain can produce inflammation. And then at about that time also, there was Padre Pio in France, who every Easter developed bleeding and painful inflammation of the palms of the hands. <clears throat> By contrast, often it is in religious ceremonies that the brain suppresses pain, bleeding, inflammation, and allows repetitive body piercing and fire without scarring. These are people that I photographed. There's a Hindu ceremonial body piercing done frequently during Hindu ceremonies producing no bleeding, no pain, and no scarring. And more amazingly was this person in South Africa. There's a musical event going on in praise of Allah. He is dancing 
he's put a sword into his abdomen above the liver, some six centimeters. There's no bleeding, no pain, and no scarring, and he has done it before. This indicates that the emotion through the brain can suppress inflammation. And my previous previously showed that it can cause inflammation. <clears throat> I specialize in the swollen leg, affecting 20 million people in India due to a mosquito-borne parasite. And in Ethiopia, due to not wearing footwear in an irritant soil. Odor and inflammatory episodes resulting in rejection and isolation from family and communities. I show a picture of a lymphedema clinic, which needs both science and humanity. The science in this clinic with no smiles in rural India uses Indian herbs to control odor and infection, as well as yoga to mobilize the swollen tissue. But humanity is necessarily necessary. Friendly and encouraging counseling is especially helpful when delivered with smiles. To heal the effects of not wearing shoes and an irritant toil, one must eliminate the long face seen here due to community rejection, as well as treating the damaged feet. Sad, long faces. By contrast, restoring the feet with the gift of footwear, washing, and creating smiles allows people to return to work and produces happiness. Arranging a celebration which includes laughter and a dance completes the therapy. This is in Ethiopia. One ancient disease, which was leprosy, and one new disease, COVID-19, managed by social distancing. Leprosy, the prototype of disfigurement, was always managed by isolation. Now we wonder whether it was really the right thing to do, and we no longer do it in leprosy. COVID-19 is now managed by social isolation. One has to be aware of the inflammatory effects of loneliness and beware of making care homes cut off from friendship like leprosy villages on Chinese mountain tops, or like the cages of wild animals, cruelly confining and lacking the friendly smiles, compassion and touch. Here you see a leprosy village in South China, which is now being used for a range of disabilities, including the frail elderly. And I fear that there is a tendency to believe that isolation of these villages away from friendly, smiling volunteers is a good management principle, but it is not so. I would like to make out, you understand that pets, toys, environmental objects, as substitutes for human friendships are important. The child and the tribal primitive learn humanity from a range of animate and inanimate stimuli, including toys, pets, God, the spiritual, ancestors, rocks, mountains, and gardens. Caring required, for example, for a puppy teaches people to utilize, to teaches the brain to utilize neurological pathways as a mechanism that we use equally well for caring for other kinds of subjects. Taking a teddy bear to bed, making a pet's tail wag, saying aloud to a tree how beautiful you are, or releasing the caged animal into space are all therapeutic maneuvers as good probably for COVID-19 as they were for leprosy and certainly help the isolated lonely. Thank you.
right on time. Thank you, Professor Ryan. That was right on time as well. Very, very interesting. And these slides of references, I will also share um, after, the, after the webinar. So Professor Ryan, if you can stop sharing, if you can see the button there, I am getting ready to share Professor Adam Hart's um, video that he sent us in today. Actually, Professor Ryan, uh, Professor Adam Hart has sent us a 30 minute video and we've edited it down to um, 17 minutes. So we'll play this now, but the full version will be available on our YouTube channel um, shortly after, after this. So I will share. So here we are. And get this playing. Hello, I'm Adam Hart and I'm Professor of Science Communication at the University of Gloucestershire and today I'll tell you a little bit about citizen science which is an aspect of science that I've been quite involved with over the last eight years or so. And the key really to all of these is that we are talking in these mass participation um, studies of professional scientist led projects, potential mass participation from the public, generally with a relatively straightforward task, usually with no training or very little um, required for the participants and and this has been very important you know for me um, there's education and awareness raising which can be as important as the science um, when I did my I, I started a project with um, Sirin Sumner down in UCL on wasps it's called the big wasp survey and our main reason for doing that was to find out more about wasp distribution and abundance and, and patterns over time uh, but actually quite a big part of it was to be able to get a bit of a platform that we can get the message out that you know what wasps aren't as bad as you think they're actually ecologically very important they have a number of useful roles they're more complex than you imagine they've got fabulous social lives um or interesting at least from a biological perspective so it's really getting that platform and getting that uh, ability to be able to reach people and, and the project captures people's interest it gives you that extra add-on which you know for me is important like my my role is I'm professional science communication. These projects give me a really good way to communicate some of that science as well as develop the science itself. So, you know, you can develop some amazing you know, publications from this. Some of the citizen science stuff that you see being published now across the world, really, really interesting stuff. But in all cases, or in many of those cases, there's also been this, this awareness raising, this education, this platform that they give you. So it can all work together very, very neatly. And I think that's something that's, that's really useful to come from it. Underpinning it all, of course, you have to have solid science. And there's a whole load of ethical conversations that go on now about you know, citizen science projects should make the data widely available. There should always be an aim in mind. It shouldn't just be a, we're going to raise awareness about this thing by collecting a bunch of data and then just letting it stew in an Excel sheet that no one opens. Um, you know, we really, we really have to have a, an end point in mind that, that there's a proper project underpinning it, but it can give you a great platform to, to get the message out and to engage with lots and lots of people. If we look across time at citizen science, we will see an enormous uptick here. Um, and this, you know, the last few years has gone through the roof as well. Interestingly, citizen science has appears in, in articles and stuff. Um, that's the appears in topics and titles has tended to, to, to level off a little bit because we don't need to, we don't need to have it the title anymore. We found this out by citizen science. It's just, we found this out. It's part of the method. But the reason why we've seen this huge uptick is very, very simple and straightforward. We all carry in our pockets now fabulous devices that allow us to communicate pretty much instantly with almost anyone and to be able to upload data, photographs, geotagged images, all kinds of things that enable us as scientists to harvest data that even 20 years ago would be unimaginable, even 10 years ago actually, let's be honest, even five years ago would be unimaginable. And, you know, back in 2000, people were, you know, you still have a computer that you went to in a house, you know, maybe, maybe you had a laptop, you certainly didn't have a tablet, yeah, and then suddenly we've got phones and smartphones and the internet and and it's just ballooned. It's absolutely ballooned. And and yeah, that's 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 the reason why citizen science has flown. It's it's just pure and simple as access. It's much, much easier for us as scientists to set things up and for people to take part. And once that once that connection is solid, it's just absolutely mushroomed. So yeah, that rise. Techno te technology driven and one of the disadvantages of course with technology um, expanding so quickly and developing so quickly is that as soon as you get the hang of one platform a survey monkey used to be where it 
what, what it was all about. Um, if you set up a survey monkey, it was great. Still very useful, actually, but now everyone's moving on to apps. Um, and you get an app built, and now you can build your own app, and then you can piggyback on other apps, and you think, okay, I'm going to get my message out on social media. I'm going to be all over Twitter. And then suddenly you realize that everyone's on Instagram. So you go to Instagram, and everyone's moving to something else. Um, so it is, it, is a, it is a challenge as well to keep up with the technology, but, but it's a huge opportunity. So I'm just going to talk briefly about one of the sub studies that I've done, just to give you a flavour for the sorts of data that you can collect. Um, I did a spider survey with the Royal Society of Biology and a few other people, um, and the idea was that we wanted to we wanted to find out more about spider season, which we've kind of been at the moment. Um, we get these larger house spiders, as they're called, Tegenaria and a couple of other genera, coming into our houses, causing great um, alarm among some people and all kinds of newspaper stories about you know, giant spiders are invading the country. Um, not true. It's just awesome. Nothing to get too excited about. But as with the flying ants I mentioned earlier, we don't know that much about it. There's been a couple of studies, one was done in sort of a fairly small area of Yorkshire, for example. But but we needed to find, I think we wanted to find out much more about the national pattern. Is there a north sort of south kind of movement? Is there a south to north movement, for example? Does, does it migrate north with autumn where we start seeing these emergencies? Um, how do they decay over time? Where do we find them? Um, a lot of people say it's the males moving around looking for females. Well, is that true? You know, you can sex them fairly easily if you can get close enough and have a look at the front end around here with their sort of boxing glove like palps which rooms are particularly uh, preferable to them we can find out quite a lot about spider sort of household ecology if you like from this as well as some very basic information about spider season when it starts when it finishes and so on so we set up a, a very basic app and a very basic recording portal um, and asked people to go on and, and we've been lucky uh, it was a slow news day when my press release hit the <laughs> hit the wires, and it ended up as a front page story in the Daily Star. They kind of didn't, yeah, that's not really what I said in the press release, right? I didn't say we're being attacked by giant spiders. What I said was, it's been a really good summer, and there's lots of prey around, and spiders are predators, so, you know, maybe they've had the chance to reach their full potential, I think, was what I said. But that's been twisted here. I was a little bit, um, my stomach sank when I saw that headline, but um, then I realized, actually, this is all good publicity. In fact, the story, beyond the headline, the story, actually, is often the case in tabloids when they cover science, cover the science and the ecology incredibly well, um, really, really thoroughly and, and very evenly and we got lots and lots of hits and loads of newspapers picked up on this my phone was almost melting over the two or three days after this came out we got such a lot of coverage we were on um the zoe ball show and various other bits and pieces and it was great because we got tens of thousands of app downloads i think at one point this app was actually the most um, downloaded sort of um uh kind of informative you know non-fiction app if you like um across a few days that didn't all translate into records there's always a drop off in this lots of people are enthused about it they have to do something else they have to do something else you get this decay and we're, we're finding out more and more about that actually as we as we find out more about these studies but we still got a good number of records ten thousand or so across the country that let us um, build up a really thorough picture actually of, of spot season um so we had all kinds of grass this is um, just to show you some of the some of the data that you can get um so we've got this lovely decay graph this isn't just down to people losing interest, so you can control that for the amount of coverage you've got and app downloads and all that sort of stuff. Um, so this is this is a sort of real phenomenon. We found that 82% of them were males, as we as we suggested, or as we had been suggested, but not thoroughly tested. Um, you can find out what time they're they're most um, likely to be seen, which is about half past seven. Now that is also, unfortunately, the time that people sit down to watch the television quite often. But by looking at patterns through the rooms and various other bits and pieces, again, you can control for that a little bit. But when you're involved in citizen science, you do have to allow for the fact that you're also sometimes measuring properties of the citizens. So, for instance, flying ants, if you were to just look at our distribution map, you would conclude that flying ants are very, very common in cities and towns. Well, actually, no, our distribution maps if you just look at them in raw form, pretty much mirror population density across the UK. Um, you have to dig a little bit deeper, but we, we were aware of that. We, you know, we were aware of some of the, the data problems, um, but they do generate a lot of data problems some of these projects. And in the case of flying ants, we ended up actually taking on uh, a data analyst for, for several months to, to sort out some of these things and, and, and get to the bottom of them because it was rapidly becoming a, a more complex problem than, than we were able to, um, to fix. 
So that is something that's worth thinking about. You, you can end up generating a lot of data. Very, it's a nice problem to have, but it's still a problem. Uh, and we were also able to, to, to delve in and get lots of stuff. Uh, I'm not sure how clear this slide will be on whatever screen, but basically we were able to look at rooms um, and look at sex ratios in different rooms, for example, look at the location within the rooms, look at the location within sex, look at the timings of the sightings and piece together some really quite interesting nuances of spider ecology from, from the very basic data that we were asking people to collect. I was really surprised how many people wanted to take part in this. And I was also surprised at how many people submitted sex data, which, um, well, taken out of context doesn't sound good, but the, the sex of the spider um, data, we, because that involves getting quite close to the spider to find out. We got lots of people sending us photographs and, and all sorts of things, and quite a lot of nice emails from people saying, I used to be terrified of spiders, I'm trying to, you know, your, your projects made me appreciate them a little bit, and I'm trying to do this, and here's my data, and I'm, you know, it was really, it, I felt like the awareness raising and the sort of, engagement with the science of it was, was was having some traction, which was really interesting. So what's the future of citizen science? Well, I think we're going to find us making more complex use of citizens. Um, I'm already starting to do that with the big WASP survey that I mentioned earlier. Um, we've now got a group of about uh, 1,200 dedicated trappers who, who help us. We were able to use a smaller group of those, about 300 or so, to, to field test for us a new identification scheme during the COVID crisis. And then an even smaller group actually then gave us some really detailed feed, feedback about how we could do that. None of that would have been possible you know, without this form of, of sort of partnership developing. We recruited those people three or four years ago. They stayed with the project. They are very much our research partners now, and, and we're able to make more complex use of them. And they, and they want to, you know, we, we said to them, would you be willing to help us develop this identification app? And within half an hour, 600 of them, I, we couldn't believe it when it came in. I assumed it was just auto replies or a fault with the email, but about half of them have replied, I think within an hour of getting that email saying, yes, we'd love to, you know, maybe a lockdown effect and people are looking for things to do perhaps, but, but they were really, really enthused and really, really keen to be involved. I, th I think because that sense of partnership and we keep them informed with what we do and, 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 you know, keep them up to date with various sort of channels and platforms, but, but it's, it's a really valuable partnership for us just just as a, any other collaborative partnership is valuable you know this just happens to be a partnership with with 1200 people who you know will probably never physically meet and and that leads into the next step which is that, that i think we can start being more subtle with our levels of engagement you know we can build up projects where we have perhaps 50,000 people are giving us one piece of information but but some of them will give us two and then we can bring some in and we can end up with these super engagers who are, who are going the whole hog and i think for you know, some of the health um, things that, that I've been discussing with, um, with people, that type of different levels of engagement is really very interesting sort of direction of travel for this. You know, you don't have to have one project where people do one thing and that's the end of it. You can actually have a more subtle sort of graded project where you think more about how people are going to be engaged. Um, I think that will lead to directed action where we'll actually be able to say to people, yeah, in my field, it might be, we don't have very many records about 10 miles from you yeah, would you go and survey this area or you know we don't, we don't we need some flying ant data and we're not sure what's happening at the end of july can you keep a close eye out in your garden for that you know we can actually engage people in a more directed way than just this sort of blanket just contact us when you've got some data and i think that's going to be interesting and i suppose everybody's always looking for interdisciplinarity and so on but i think we are going to see some real cross-discipline things developing because um when you're collecting information on something involving people, you're also collecting some potentially valuable information in terms of people. Um, but of course, that also has ethical and, and in some cases legal ramifications. So this sort of landscape is you know, becomes a little more complex as you get deeper into it. But, but these are all problems that can be solved and, and actually often advantages and opportunities. I think we might also see more passive citizen sensing um, or passive citizen science in the form of citizen sensing. Um, things like Twitter mining and sort of social media mining are fairly well known. Yeah, um, this guy wearing the glasses there, that's Google Glass, never really took off, but it will, right? We're all carrying around microphones in our pockets. If you walk through and you hear birdsong, your phone will hear birdsong too. And actually, 
if in geo locates where you are and enough people walk around, we could probably map the territories of birds if there's enough people walking around entirely passively if we had access to microphones. Um, that, of course, is a legal and, and ethical implication. Uh, we're all generating data all the time. Data scientists use that use those data. Other people use those data, including political scientists. But perhaps we can also start to um, make use of those data in, in different ways. All of this, of course, has with it a whole load of other baggage, and you know, in some cases, that can be quite tricky. Even even just um, you know, using images that are posted on social media can be quite difficult. So, one of the things that that people have started doing in ecology is making use of photos that people have uploaded that, that have animals with specific characteristics that allow them to be individually identified. Um, and that can be really useful for following animals through um, areas, particularly if there's lots of people taking photos of them or looking at migrations and so on. Uh, but equally, those photos, if they're uploaded, haven't been uploaded for that purpose. You are you are using them for purposes that aren't there. They may be geotagged. They may be an endangered species that are geotagged. There can be all kinds of of issues and and you know we're thinking those through in ecology and i think i think it's it's well it's very very wise at the beginning to think through those things quite carefully for our starling survey for example we asked people to report those amazing murmurations you see in the sky a very common time for them to happen is sort of five o'clock which is a very common time for people to be driving home and what we didn't want was people sort of putting their car into a ditch to try and get information about this murmuration. So you know, part of our kind of directions were, were taking account of that as a form of risk assessment. But you know, any, any study that you do has some implications. So I think that's something that all of us are becoming much more aware of and some of the subtleties of it as we get more into doing different things. But just to finish, I'd just like to sort of emphasize what I kind of started with actually that um, for a while, citizen science became more about the method than about the findings, and it became very um, a very cool thing to do, and there were lots of projects, and, and I followed some of those projects through, and I didn't see an end result. I didn't really know what they were going to do, and, and they didn't actually produce any what we would call science. There's no publications that have come out of it. I couldn't access the data. Um, we're starting to move away from that now, and that's good. But it's always well to, to realize that however snazzy the technique, whether it's citizen science or whether it's you know some machine that goes ping, underlying it all is is the scientific method. And yeah, you know, that's observation, question, hypothesis, prediction, test. And it's those observations and questions at the beginning that underlie all of it. And that's actually something that I think we can also make use of in terms of citizen science because not only are we crowdsourcing observations, but we could also start to crowdsource observations and ideas and questions. And, and that's really, really important. And I think that will be developed by developing these partnerships between science and the public that are, are built much more on, on sort of solid, firm foundations and also on trust. And, you know, within citizen science, we have to make sure that we, we live up to that trust. Um, so that's a sort of a cautionary note. Uh, but citizen science is a really... I found it an incredibly valuable way to get, to get data, to build up partnerships, both collaborative research partnerships within sort of you know, professional scientists, but also those partnerships with the public. And, and I find it a really, really rewarding way um, to go about doing science. Thank you very much. Thank you to Professor Adam Hart. And I must apologise because at the beginning of um, Professor Adam's uh, presentation, I, I didn't get a chance to introduce him. So I must, um, I think because he's on um, broadcast for BBC Radio 4, BBC 4, BBC 2, as well as weekly radio programmes um, like Science in Action, we all feel like we know Professor Adam Hart from University of Gloucestershire already. So we'll move on now to Dr Christian Raya from um, the University of Bristol. Kristen has worked in livestock practice in three countries and holds a PhD in veterinary epidemiology. She currently leads interdisciplinary research group, the AMR Force, which is focused on antimicrobial resistance, as well as directs the first studies applying to a counselling style called motivational interviewing to veterinary client communication. So Kristen, yeah. I'll hand over to you. Great, thanks. Are you ready to share? Are you happy? I think so. See if we can make it work. Yes. <laughs> can you see that? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Great, super. Thanks very much, Don, and thanks very much for asking me to speak today with a great um, list of speakers and some really interesting presentations that we've already had. 
So I was asked to talk about partnering with policymakers and with industry, and I'm going to do this a little bit through the lens that I usually work with policymakers and industry on, and that's research, and particularly research looking at antibiotic stewardship usage and resistance in this context of One Health. As Don said, I'm a veterinarian, so I come at this from a veterinary medicine standpoint, but I'm also a person, so I think about human health, and I live in an environment, so I think about environmental health as well. And many of you, well, I don't know, can you guys see the, is it advancing? It hasn't moved on, maybe give it another. Mm. Is it at a frozen moment? Maybe, or maybe it's because I am sharing, I, may, I tried to make it present. Should move on. Maybe I need to go to the presentation screen. Sorry, it was all going so well. <laughs> we like technology problems. Ah, oh, there we go. And we're done now, great. So many of you might have heard in the media or from other sources about this public and scientific concern about antimicrobial resistance. And uh, Dr. Khan already spoke about it earlier today. So thinking about resistant and resisting bacteria and the transfer of that, there's been quite a lot in the media recently about the worry about transfer of resistance from animals to people. But what we know from the evidence is that the main driver of resistance in people remains the use of antimicrobials in human medicine. So Dr. Khan talked about some other potential things that we may not have investigated and a really interesting hypothesis about fecal material and how that spread around and how that gets into the environment, et cetera. But most of the data points to the fact that this use of, of antimicrobials in people is what drives resistance in people. But we also know that antimicrobial resistance affects all of us, both personally, because we are people and we have families and we have people and that we care about that we don't want to necessarily get infected or have a problem. And it also affects us professionally, particularly as veterinarians, as medical professionals, et cetera. It's something that we deal with and something that we think about. And in the UK, looking at this, we have a really nice One Health report that is published quite often. And this is data from 2017 and the One Health report that was published in 2019, showing that in the UK, about a third of the total antimicrobials that are sold at a national level go into animals. This is mainly livestock, but also some companion animals. And about two thirds of these go into people. But when we look at kilo per kilo, when we think about how heavy the cow is that I might be injecting with antibiotics versus how heavy the child is or the adult, we see that about three times more antibiotics are used in people on a kilo per kilo basis than are used in animals. So again, different ways you approach this gives you some, some idea about how these things are used and how, they're, how they might be influencing resistance in the UK. And the way UK agriculture has dealt with this is through the Responsible Use of Medicines and Agriculture Alliance, which is a group of organizations that are representing every stage of food production, really from the farm till it gets on your plate, and thinking about how can we well coordinate and integrate our approach to make sure that the, these important medicines are used in the best way forward. So you can see all the logos on here, these are members of the Responsible Use of Medicines and Agricultural Alliance working together in their different sectors to really address this issue. And the way that the, this organization decided to address this issue was thinking about the different sectors and that the pig sector has very different challenges than the poultry sector or the dairy sector or the beef sector. And really it didn't make sense, although it was recommended in government and in the O'Neill report to have an overall usage target for the amount of antimicrobials that were used, maybe that didn't make the sense to have the same target in each of the sectors. So we asked the sectors to think for themselves what would be reasonable targets that you could set in your sectors, knowing that there was this multi-species target of about 50 milligrams per kilogram, and the government asked that that be achieved by 2018, well, the sectors working together and doing this completely voluntarily were able to achieve that target by 2016, so two years early, in fact. And we did this together by thinking about, all right, we need to use these antimicrobials in animals for a welfare standpoint. If they have a bacterial infection, then they need to be treated. 
but we maybe need to use less and we can be a bit braver and not just give them antimicrobials when they show a sign of disease as sometimes happens in veterinary medicine and as you can imagine sometimes happens in human medicine as well. We've all seen the posters about if you have a cough and a sore throat, it used to be you likely had a cold, now you might have COVID, um, but we don't necessarily, those things are viral and don't necessarily need antibiotics. So the tagline that we used for this was as little as possible, but as much as necessary. And also in this One Health report, you can see they, they highlight very well the gains that have been made in this. So you can see between 2013 and 2017, the animal bodies were able to reduce their usage in antibiotics by about 40%. And this month they'll publish the 2019 data and that's gone up above 50% now. So rapid gains, really great. And again, all done vol voluntarily through the livestock, ag the livestock agriculture industries to reduce that antimicrobial usage. And similarly in people, there were many efforts and the, the former chief medical officer wrote individual letters to GP practices that were using above what they thought the antim antimicrobial usage should be. And they were also able to reduce their usage over this time period. And a lot of shared learning, again, thinking about this one health sphere that can be done. How do the livestock industries do this so well? How is the human medical practices done this so well? What can we learn from one another? So I think that's a really interesting thing to consider. As Don mentioned, this is our research group, the AMR Force, and we've won a couple of Antibiotic Guardian Awards in the UK for some of the work that we've done, working with farmers, working with policy and the research that we've done. And you'll see on this slide as well, lots of different logos for the different collaborators that we work with. These are funders, these are industry bodies, veterinary practices, government bodies. And we really like to work with everybody because we think everybody has a stake in this. And if we're all working together and pulling in the same way, then we can really make a difference. And you'll see highlighted in the bubbles, so the different things that we work on, thinking about how understanding how we use medicines, improving animal health so that we don't need to use medicines, motivating change and working with people. Again, the communications that Don mentioned, how do we talk to people about how we use these important medicines and make a difference? Clearly the microbiology and understanding what's happening with the bacteria is important. And as we're making changes, what unintended consequences are we having? How can we make sure that we're doing the right thing all the time? Sometimes we're doing this in an absence of evidence. So we want to continually assess the impact that we're having when we're making changes. So as I've stated, we really think that antimicrobial stewardship is a shared responsibility. We've done quite a lot of work with retailers and, and those sorts of industries. So we were asked by a major UK retailer to help them design an antimicrobial stewardship policy. And we said, yeah, well, we could probably give you some expert advice, but what we want you to do is get all your farmers in a room and let them come up with the policy. And they delivered a leading policy by thinking about what they could actually do on farm, what they could do together, what they were willing to do. And what they were willing to do really blew a lot of us out of the water for what we thought that they would do, but they owned this process and they really made great strides forward. We've done quite a lot of work looking at data, sitting down with veterinarians and farmers, getting them to review the medicines that are used on farm and why they're used and benchmarking them against one another so that they can kind of compete a little bit to do better in this realm. Also getting farmers to share their best practices, getting them together on farms to talk about how they make changes and how they are the best stewards of antimicrobials that they can be. And I've mentioned the communications we actually adopted from the medical sciences, a communications methodology called motivational interviewing and applied that to the veterinary sphere to think about what motivates people and how can we talk to them in a way that reaches their motivations and gets them to change their behavior by what's really important to them. And we also recognize that we need to have data. So just like in the last talk where we're talking about apps that collect data, we want easy to use information technology for farmers so that they can just scan the ear tag of an animal, scan the bottle of antimicrobial, type in that they use 15 milliliters, that, event, that immediately goes to their software, it goes to their vet software, and everybody can use it and everybody can benefit from knowing what's being used on farm. So we've worked very closely with data providers and app developers in order to do things like that. And we're creating a database resource 
for antimicrobial resistance research that has a One Health scope. So we knew that there were disparate data sets of usage of antimicrobials, laboratory results about resistance, as well as risk factors that were occurring on farms. But these were held by different retailers, different stakeholders. But as a scientist, what I want is to bring that all together into one place. And so when we started this project, I thought, well, we have a national health service in the UK. They prescribe antibiotics and they have resistance patterning and they have lab results. So I'm sure that it's all done in one, under one house in human medicine. Let's see how they did it. We'll come to find out it wasn't all done under one house in human medicine. And so we started trying to do it in the veterinary sphere. And then along came COVID and suddenly we've made it much easier for people to share data. And so we're advancing not only in the veterinary sphere about sharing these data and being able to bring them together for research, but also in the human sphere. And that's very exciting, again, to see the shared learnings between those two spheres. We have a lot of research going on in this area with One Health clearly in the title. We have a big study in the UK where we looked at dairy cows and dogs that walk across dairy cows and humans that live in the same geographical area as those dairy cows and those dogs to see if there was very much transmission from the animals to the people or from the people to the human, to the, from the people to the animals. Uh, I'll give you the spoiler that there wasn't very much transmission at all. But we have similar work ongoing in Thailand as well as in Argentina, looking at different livestock industries and looking at people as well to look at this transfer. And we have a big social science project that looks at diagnostic innovation and how that's impacting veterinarians and how that's impacting the livestock spheres. So again, thinking about how people and their activities really make a difference for antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance in animals. So as you will know, there are lots of drivers for change. And again, as I've said, we've really tried to interact with them, talk to them about what things can be done differently, how we can all work together, thinking about the food chain and processors, retailers, and even consumers that drive a lot of this and think about, okay, what are you getting and what do you want and how can we make those changes sustainable? Obviously the veterinary profession and farmers using preventative health plans, ensuring quality and farmers go into this business because they want to see animals be healthy and productive and they want to do a good job. So having them on side is really essential as well as working with politicians and governments and thinking about, okay, if we have cheap food policies, what does that mean for the way that food is produced? If we're importing from different countries, what are the standards in those countries and how do those match up with the standards that we set for our own farms? So I firmly believe that we do need antimicrobials in veterinary medicine, as much for the benefit of my own family as for the animals that I work with and for, uh, zoonotic diseases, this is bovine TB in somebody's finger. So we need to be able to treat these things and we need to have them available to us, but we all need to be really good stewards of these important medicines. And with that, I will say thank you very much. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, that was wonderful. And almost right on time. Um, are you, are you okay to stop sharing? And then I will jump in to share. And I'll be sharing a video now from um, Dr. Sarah Gold, who is senior clinician in oncology um, for the RCVS specialist in small animal medicine. Sarah currently runs the oncology service at Langford Vet Small Animal Referral Hospital and I know that Sarah works very closely with um, our Helen Winter so it's really exciting to have her video with us today but Sarah will try to join in for the Q&A but I am conscious that in the interest of time, if you do have burning questions for any of the speakers today, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, and I will share Sarah's video now. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to join this Eye Care Collaborative Cultures webinar. Um, what I'd like to do is just briefly share with you a little insight into the revenue work done at the University of Bristol and how we've uh, initiated some collaborations with uh, um, oncology partners at the University of Bristol uh, and further afield. It's clear that veterinary and uh, human oncologists share the same goals. We often treat the same diseases, many cancers in my patients are very similar 
to human forms of the disease and, and that's the basis of some of these collaborative partnerships that we're developing. We share in the desire to achieve the best outcomes for our patients and we are frustrated by the limitations of some of those treatments. In the veterinary field, we don't have good treatments for high-grade soft tissue sarcomas, for osteosarcomas, for hemangiosarcomas, for malignant melanomas and examples. We always want to drive forward knowledge and improve the care we offer to our patients through innovation and improvements in our ability to manage these diseases. And a big part of what we do at the university is also uh, support and teach our undergraduates so that they can become caring and resilient clinicians, um, which is particularly relevant in the oncology field. Because of the strong selection for breed standards, uh, producing a homogeneous population with common morphological traits, we have developed a number of dog breeds over time um, that have significant predispositions to inherited diseases and cancers. And this offers us a unique opportunity to use spontaneous cancer in dogs as a model for human disease. And because humans and dogs share many of the same environmental factors that may influence disease and onset and progression of these uh, diseases, uh, studying uh, the canine versions of these cancers uh, may be of great merit to our human counterparts. Uh, we know, as I say, that there are many brief predispositions to cancer. My colleague Jane Dobson at Cambridge has studied flat coat retrievers uh, for the best part of two decades, uh, as they have a significantly high incidence of high grade soft tissue sarcomas and histiocytic sarcomas. Um, Bernese Mountain Dogs, uh, as I'm sure some of you are aware, are also similarly affected with uh, significant numbers of animals dying of histiocytic sarcoma um, to the point that the mortality rate in that breed is about 60%. Other breeds such as Rottweilers, Great Danes and Irish Wolfhounds we know are predisposed to osteosarcoma. Retrievers have susceptibility to a number of cancers, although it's interesting that our American counterparts uh, perhaps see an even higher prevalence that we do, suggesting um, some recent genetic changes uh, in that population in America. So we know that a lot of breeds have predispositions and we can look at those breeds and use those predispositions uh, to our advantage and not only perhaps help our canine patients but also uh, our human compatriots with similar forms of those diseases. And one of the cancers that we're most interested in, um, particularly with our collaborations uh, through the University of Bristol, is, is osteosarcoma. It's a rare uh, and often de devastating human cancer and there have been little improvements in survival rates in, in recent years. And in the veterinary field, uh, we see this disease far more commonly uh, and the prevalence is thought to be up to 40 times higher in, in the canine population compared to the human population, uh, with certain large breed dogs being predisposed or Rottweilers or Great Danes or Irish Wolfhounds. So this is a disease that's become of particular interest to us uh, and one that we are uh, initiating a very interesting research program uh, to try and use the canine model uh, as a pilot for some interesting work going forward. And so as I say we've initiated some, some projects uh, using the canine model of osteosarcoma uh, to help identify genes involved with the formation of this disease with disease markers uh, and hopefully our long-term goal is to try new uh, immunotherapy treatments for this uh, devastating cancer. And I just want to share with you one case example which I think um, highlights how we can perhaps be of benefit and certainly brought home to me why we need to know more about this disease. Um, 
This is a case um, that we saw a little while ago. Um, this is a young Springer Spaniel who presented with a four month history of right falling lameness that was non responsive to pain relief. Uh, radiographs, uh, which you can see there on the right hand side at the top, um, showed uh, a humeral lesion uh, consistent with an aggressive monostotic uh, bone tumour. Uh, and uh, biopsies confirm this, so uh, Jamshidi biopsies uh, from that site uh, confirmed histologically um, that the lesion was caused uh, by an osteosarcoma. The owners um, declined amputation and follow up chemotherapy and opted to continue um, with pain relief. And uh, the normal prognosis we would give for that patient would be that sadly we'd obviously expect that disease to progress. Uh, and that dog's um, prognosis would probably be around three uh, to four months and, and possibly six months if, if she was lucky. And even if she did uh, go down the road of conventional treatment, so had amputation and follow-up chemotherapy, um, most of our patients sadly only survive uh, on average uh, around a year. Uh, and that was what we uh, predicted um, would happen uh, in this case, even if we had uh, undertaken the standard treatment. But this dog did something rather unusual. Um, her lameness resolved uh, over four months, um, so she became pain free uh, and had normal weight bearing. And repeat radiographs taken um, a few months down the road show resolution of that lytic lesion in the proximal humerus. Uh, and she remains alive and well uh, two years uh, since her initial diagnosis. And these are the sorts of cases that really inspire us to understand more about this disease and how we may use cases like this and the disease in the dog population generally uh, to help us move forward with our diagnosis of this disease uh, and treatments going forward. So we've started, as I say, these collaborations primarily with osteosarcoma, but we'll certainly move forward with other tumour types. And I think um, what these collaborations have already shown us is that working together, we can enhance our knowledge uh, and understanding. It is one disease. Um, working together, we hope to improve treatments uh, and therefore the prognosis of both our canine and our human patients. And working together, we can make a difference every day, just knowing that we're part of projects that might make a, a bigger difference is inspiring to us all. I hope this little insight has been useful uh, to you. Thank you to uh, my colleagues uh, Helen Winter at uh, Bristol, uh, Grace uh, Edmonds and thank you uh, to Aptasia as well for the invitation to speak and I hope to catch you later during the question and answer session. Thank you. Oh, that was a great presentation and it leads us on. I'm going as quick as I can to introduce um, Helen, who is a medical oncologist at Bristol Cancer Institute. And Helen is committed to clinical research to improve outcomes for patients. And hopefully that makes up for my little fluff at the beginning of the webinar where I didn't do a very good job of introducing you, Helen. So you've shared your screen and are you happy to get started? Yeah. All, all here done. No, it was really to say as much as Laura and I as doctors would like to take credit for driving forward One Health, it really is at the um, feet of the, the vets and our environmental colleagues. So it was just to make sure that doctors weren't laying claim to something that actually I think we've been rather slow to adopt, but hopefully that's all changing. Um, Dawn, can I just check you can just see the presentation? Not yet. If you just um, start from beginning. Yeah. And then that should. Maybe it just needs a minute to. Yeah, if you want to set it up and then I'll, I'll make a start. Yeah, sure. Um, and uh, if you yeah. if you stop sharing, I'll start sharing. Yep. And I will. Yeah, let's do it that way. 
Um, so I'm just going to make a start. So really, this presentation I've, I've entitled Building Bridges and all about today, it's about extending those um, arms of friendliness and uh, building uh, some new collaborations. And I'm just going to talk very briefly, just in the interest of time, building on what Sarah's talked about, cancer outcomes in companion animals and how we are now working um, as clinicians to say, well, shall we try and do things differently? And can we learn from our veterinary colleagues or learn with our veterinary colleagues to improve cancer outcomes? Next slide. Um, it's a very exciting time to be an oncologist, even though it's a very difficult time at, 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 at during this COVID crisis. And I'm very reminded of colleagues that have sadly lost their lives and those that are shielding during COVID-19. But the work for cancer patients and for all our patients with other illnesses must continue. Um, and so the future, there is some hope on the, on the horizon that new changes with nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, um, the the um, biomarkers, whether that's genomics, proteomics, me metabolomics, um, and new therapies. So there, there is real, real hope on the horizon, but it really can't come quick enough for many of our cancer patients. Next slide, Dawn, thanks. Um, and so um, I'll come back to Alice at, at the end, but this is a young adolescent patient, and we are still seeing far too many patients presenting with a delayed diagnosis. Alice actually had the first couple of rounds of chemotherapy whilst on ECMO, whilst on bypass, after suffering a cardiac arrest and with her presentation of a high-grade uh, cancer. So there's still a lot of work to, to do, and I, I'm sure in whatever capacity we're involved with and whatever we're joining this webinar, sadly, we will all be affected um, in some way by someone with cancer. Um, and so we've really got to uh, work together to say, look, this is as big a crisis uh, as anything else that, that, that we faced and that we are likely to face. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I'm not going to talk any more about osteosarcoma, except to mention, just as um, Sarah said, that not only are there commonalities of where this disease is seen in both canines in the top x-ray and humans in the, in the below MRI image on the right, but actually the devastating impact that can have, the generally quite poor survivals, the poor improvement in survivals over many years for both canines, but particularly for, for humans and adolescents. Um, and that is largely due to the secondary spread to the lungs and uh, other widespread metastases and the pattern of disease, the genetics of the disease, the distribution of disease and actually the treatment of the disease is very similar. And as Sarah mentioned, that as it is more common in dogs, it does make sense to be working with our veterinary colleagues to say, what can we learn about um, how vets are, are seeing presentations of osteosarcoma and when we are presented with particularly adolescents with cancer? Next slide. Um, so... Um, I have a role with the Cancer Research Network in the Southwest, and one of the NIH um, high-level objectives is to increase adolescence in clinical trials because we believe that the only way to improve outcomes for patients with cancer, or one of the many ways that we can do it, is through clinical trials and access to research. So sadly, um, for many reasons, and people have looked into why, why that is so, we're still not seeing enough people having access of, of new research. Um, so there's been a real pulling together of both paediatrics and oncologists, coupled with what we're trying to set up with some engagement with adolescent patients to say, how can we do things differently and how can we improve out outcomes, particularly for young people with cancer? Next slide. And, and really the same thing applies for rare cancers. So um, there are a lot of different cancers, but obviously the people that have rare cancers that are, that have, are, are less popular or, or, or we hear about less, there has been traditionally less scientific focus, therefore less financial support, less research into those. So it's a real challenging area. And for patients, they really don't like to be told this is a rare cancer, we don't really see a lot of this. So there's a lot of work for us working together, both nationally and globally and increasing our networks so that we can improve outcomes for people with rare cancers, so that people don't feel that not only have they got this unusual cancer, often that have very poor prognosis, but also that there is, um, actually a, a real force for, for good to improve outcomes for them. And it's, it's not just something that, 
uh, people aren't used to seeing or dealing with because that really doesn't help our patients at the end of the day. Next slide. So um, this is all about building collaborations. Um, I think certainly what, what we have developed through our collaboration with Cardiff and Bristol is that we have this shared mission that we believe that in, in improving outcomes and looking at new ways and new innovative approaches to doing our cancer research. So we are trying to set up a canine biobank that will look at osteosarcoma sarcoma samples in the first instance but also may lead to other chronic illness samples and so that vets and scientists and doctors can learn alongside each other and share that wealth of knowledge that we're seeing from those samples um, and also obviously involving um, citizen science and our actual patients as they will come up with ideas and research uh, questions that then hopefully we can incorporate and take forward. Next slide, please. Um, so today is all about creating a collaborative um, culture. Um, this is the bell that many people um, ring when they finish their treatment, but actually another celebration of success is that Ethiopian dance, which has been uh, really a really lovely image that um, Terence shared with us. Um, so I think it is about celebrating those successes when we get when we get things right, but also about having a clarity of vision and 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 really a shared cause. Starting small, like the canine biobank, although it's not actually particularly small, but it's a small step towards a wider um, and incremental uh, incremental step to improving outcomes for both canines and humans with cancer. Um, listening to understand, so hopefully learning from each other and actually thinking about things from another perspective, which certainly One Health has, has shown us. Um, and then leveraging team strengths, so everyone playing to their strengths. And I think the one thing that One Health sort of allows us to do is show our vulnerability, admit when we don't know all the answers and actually, you know, think and, and really be explicit about learning another way of working, um, because what we're doing, we certainly can improve on. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is in, in just a conclusion and a, and a way forward. Um, I think that we need to have a can-do attitude. I think we need to say we're not happy with the status quo. We can do better. Um, have an inclusive culture. So for some of our COVID research, we've actually been much more um, involving junior doctors at the coalface and having experts sort of really teaching people um, at the beginning of their careers that there are new ways of working and new ways of doing research. Um, a can-do attitude is, is always good. But when I, when I look here at Sophie, who, who sadly died from a GBM before the pandemic, um, she had a five-year battle with this tumour, um, having been diagnosed with her youngest child at six months. Um, and um, for much of that time, she had you know, re a really tough struggle with a, a, a glioblastoma. So when I see that picture, it reminds me that there's much more work to do and we really can't rest on our, our laurels. Next slide. Um, and just so finally to just thank and sort of bring, bring the um, webinar to a, to a close before we just have a few questions. I'd like to thank all the patients and families that do get involved in research for colleagues at Bristol and Cardiff and your new collaborations that we've been establishing over the, the last year, uh, to the Bristol Cancer Research Network that has really welcomed um, this new approach and a One Health approach and has been very supportive in our collaboration with the Vet School, particularly Sarah and, and Grace Edmonds that have been mentioned. Um, and obviously to my colleagues at Actasia with my other hat on, um, it's been really great bringing those two sort of roles together and saying, can we work differently? And learning from what Actasia has done with Caring for Life and its collaborations um, in Asia, bringing that sort of back to, to the UK and say there is, you know, there are new ways of, of working. So I thank them for that and obviously for their work in setting up this webinar. Obviously, my colleagues at Oxford University and, and Terence, you've heard today, um, and uh, you know, much learning from, from, from my senior colleagues there. Um, and also Wasava that we mentioned at the beginning. So it was really them that, that um, after a conversation that I'd had with Arbiter, who'd been trying to find like-minded physicians to really start building these collaborations and do things differently. 
And just finally, just to say, uh, this is Alice now, um, who um, is in complete um, remission from her high grade um, lymphoma and has just started at university. Maybe not quite the freshest time that she had because of lockdown, but I'm absolutely delighted that um, she agreed to have her photo used as our poster. And she um, and Sophie give, have given me a lot of motivation and inspiration to say, come on, let's not, um, let's not stick to the status quo. There's a lot of work that we should all be doing and working together. Thanks very much. Thank you, Helen. And that ends our uh, presentations and speakers today, but we did say that we would have time for questions and answer. And I, I think in the um, Q&A box, we do not have any open questions. I think Laura's kindly jumped in to answer one. Um, so if there are no further questions, I'll close the webinar and I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joined, to everyone who's taken part and listened. Hopefully you've learned something or at least thought, oh, I should get in touch with them and ask them about this later on. Uh, we will put the recordings that we've shown you today and the long version of Professor Adam Hart's recording onto YouTube, the ActAsia channel, and we will circulate our charter for collaborative, um, I've forgotten the word, cultures collaborative cultures sorry sorry we will circulate that once we've finished and we'll go through um we'll, we'll pick the best from each presentation today and then we will share that with everybody that's attended today so thank you for your time thank you for being with us a big thank you to all the speakers who have given their time to prepare and be with us today and if that there's nothing else helen nothing no, all good thanks for all your work dawn and uh, best wishes to everyone and stay safe everybody and, and look after themselves during this next lockdown that we're about to have. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.